I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today six proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter was received from Senator Roberts. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. When Australia restarts our migration program, we do not want migrants to return to Australia in the same numbers and in the same composition as before the crisis. I understand. Um, is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific time to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I recognise that for 230 years, migrants of many races and religions, amazing people from all over the world, have joined us to build our beautiful country into something greater than when they arrived. Now, though, we may be ending 2020 with 1.2 million Australians out of work and 1.2 million temporary visas. For 20 years, Senator Hanson has warned that this day would come. In 2016, the Productivity Commission issued its 700-page warning on the imbalance in our immigration policy. Their report questioned our high immigration intake's strain on infrastructure, the environment and quality of life in our capital cities. The government ignored the Productivity Commission. Why? To keep the flood of cut price workers coming in and to hide the data showing a per capita recession. That led to a long-term pain on infrastructure, housing, wages, state budgets. The inevitable result of that is high unemployment and more underemployment. Many of these un unemployed Australians are migrants who came to contribute their labour, yet now languish on job seeker benefits they don't want instead of going to the job they do want. I congratulate one of my Labor colleagues on finally seeing the light and joining us in speaking up on the issue of excessive migration and foreign workers. People might not be aware that on the 3rd of May, in a Sydney Morning Herald opinion piece, Senator Keneally asked, quote, do we want migrants to return to Australia in the same numbers and in the same composition as before the crisis? Senator Keneally's answer was no. The question now is, will Senator Keneally stand by her words and will the Labor Party stand by their shadow immigration minister? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. We know that the current coronavirus crisis has changed many things about our economy. And one of the most dramatic changes we've seen is indeed our migration rate. Right now, our migration is almost zero. Because this government acted quickly to close our borders to limit the number of coronavirus cases coming into the country. Net overseas migration is expected to drop 30 per cent in 2019-20 and 85 per cent in 2020-21 from 2018-19 levels due to closed borders. Clearly, there is going to be a long period of time in which migration is going to be significantly reduced. And as the Prime Minister has said, there is no likelihood of international travel to Australia resuming in the near future. That will have major impacts on many parts of our economy. And looking at how we can support and rebuild industries affected by the cancellation of international travel will be key to Australia's economic recovery. Tourism, for example, is one of the most important industries that has been affected by this, uh, turning over $45 billion a year. Uh, and that has been incredibly badly affected as an industry by the coronavirus crisis and, of course, um, indirectly as a result of the reduced migration rate. The tourism industry and the hundreds of thousands of Australians that it employs will need visitors to be able to come to Australia when international travel is again safe and possible, and we will welcome that occurring when the appropriate time comes. Another industry that has been significantly impacted by the reduction in migration uh, as a result of coronavirus, of course, is agriculture. Agriculture is a tr key driver of the Australian economy and one which the Morrison government is strongly supporting. It's also a critical component of ensuring Australia's food security. 
Working holiday makers are an essential part of Australia's agricultural industries and indeed an essential part of the tourism industry, which I just mentioned earlier. These working holiday ma makers are critical to filling short-term workforce pardon me, shortages in rural and regional areas, and they also inject over $3 billion into our economy each year. And certainly coming from Tasmania, um, a state with a thriving tourism industry and a thriving agriculture industry, I am very uh, alive to the impact that these working holidaymakers have on our local economy. We know working holidaymakers who travel to Australia stay longer, spend more and travel further into regional areas than most other international visitors. That's why we've recently made enhancements to uh, and indeed increased the numbers of places in the work and holiday visa program to better support rural and regional areas. Of course, ideally, we want Australians filling Australian jobs, but when this isn't possible, farmers and other employers need to have a workforce available so they can continue their business. Uh, and again, as I say, in Tasmania, that is certainly um, my experience in my own state, uh, talking to people, particularly within the agricultural and tourism industries, uh, they appreciate having the ability to draw upon working holiday makers if they are not able to get, uh, indeed, locals into to jobs. So there needs to be a balance here. But that being said, obviously at the moment we know it's difficult for these industries uh, without having access to uh, migrant workforce as a result of the coronavirus crisis. As I said, we'll see an 85 per cent reduction on current uh, modelling to migration to Australia uh, in the next financial year as a result of the borders uh, having to effectively close due to coronavirus. The coalition has been consistent and we have been clear about our approach to managing the integrity and the order of our migration program. It is clarity and consistency that allows businesses and individuals to plan for the future. And I certainly expect that we will see this clarity and this consistency continue in the future as we move to uh, hopefully one day uh, begin to open up our borders again and enable further migration. Conversely, Labor's inconsistency, division and history of mismanagement of the migration program uh, has been on display as evidenced by some of the commentary we've heard recently. Their shambolic, uncoordinated approach that changes almost daily demonstrates they didn't learn any from their mistakes in government and can't be trusted to manage our Thank migration program. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, when my parents came to Australia uh, in the late 1960s, they were part of, uh, I guess, an enormous wave of arrivals who would go on to contribute greatly to the foundations of our nation's economic prosperity. In these times, people knew that they could come to Australia in search of a better life. They could put down the roots, raise a family, seek new opportunities and make their new home a better place. And at the centre of all this was the certainty that permanency provided. As a result, Australia has become one of the world's most, if not the successful, migrant nation. Around one third of all Australians were born overseas, and around half of our population are the children and grandchildren of migrants. The majority of Australians know that this is a good thing and that our multicultural society makes us a better and stronger. But owing to the policy changes first initiated in the early 2000s uh, by the Den Howard government and laid entrenched over the last seven years by this government, our migration program unfortunately has started to shift, shifting from predominantly based on um, permanency in favour of a more temporary form of migration. And I guess that's sort of the heart of the debate on, on which me and a number of other colleagues in this place have, uh, have uh, you know, made commentary in recent times. There are many hundreds of thousands of temporary visa holders here in Australia, and we are host to the second largest temporary migrant workforce in the developed world. Temporary migration will always have a place in any modern economy, but it is important that we are carefully examining what that place ought to look like here in Australia. And as the chair of the Senate Select Committee on Temporary Migration, that's exactly what I and my Senate colleagues on that committee will be looking at. 
the terms of reference of our inquiry has tasked that we investigate the temporary migration in Australia and the effect that it has on the Australian economy, its wages and jobs, as well as the so social cohesion and workplace rights and conditions of Australian workers. It also makes specific reference to whether permanent residency and permanent migration offers better outcomes to both Austra to the Australian economy and our community. And I am pleased to say that so far we've received over 70 submissions from members of the public, policy experts, industry groups um, and unions, and that they have all made for interesting reading. And I do encourage people to continue providing the committee with submissions. We've heard how the current system can leave temporary visa workers vulnerable to abuse and exploitation that it can erode wages for workers and allow anti-competitive business behaviours to go unchecked. Now, I've experienced this firsthand as an official with the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association before entering this place. I represented hundreds of 7-Eleven workers, many of them being temporary visa workers, as they sought compensation for the wage theft and blackmail many had been subjected to. In some instances, workers were paid between seven and ten dollars an hour. I met a young foreign student who was making as little as five dollars, and in some cases, their employers used their visa status, their temporary visa status, to keep them silent and prevent them from re reporting the exploitation that they endured. Now, these are matters, among many others, that the Senate Select Committee is seeking to inquire, and will provide a report back here in the Senate. Temporary migration impacts a wide range of industries, and uh, as my colleague on the on the other side, uh, Senator Chandler, had pointed out, uh, you know, hospitality and and uh, and farming, agriculture are certainly just some areas that we'll no doubt be looking into. Temporary visa workers don't just pick fruit. One in five are chefs. One in four are cooks. One in six are hospitality workers. And one in ten provide nursing support and personal care, and they all hold a temporary visa. The inquiry will put focus on important questions. We will ask our fellow Australians if we want to create and profit from an economic underclass, whether we want to stop people working in Australia from putting down roots and raising a family, as my parents did. But when they came here, they were temporary migrants, but now very proud Australians. From starting a business, creating ties with neighbours and the community, through sport, schools, churches and local groups. The list just keeps going on. Migrants, whether they are permanent or temporary, do make a, an, an enormous contribution to our society here in Australia. Labor understands the benefits of a well-regulated migration program, particularly for skilled workers. But do we as Australians, as the people of a fair society in which a growing proportion are permanently locked out of getting a go. I know firsthand the opportunities Australia can offer many people looking for a better life. I've lived that experience. I know what my parents, their family, friends and the community gave back to this great country. One of the greatest pleasures each of us has as representatives of our community is welcoming new Australian citizens when they take their pledge of citizenship. And I must say that has been one of the best highlights of my job in the last 18 months. It's a moment of joy and one I want to continue to be, a, to be available to those who thank choose you. to make Australia their home. Thank you, Senator Chikarini. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I did ponder a bit on whether, whether speaking on this motion was worth it, because it clearly seeks to divide us. But to be honest, I have had it up to here with One Nation. So I will have my say. This motion is just another way for them to define who should be in Australia, who is deemed as one of us, and who is deemed as the other because of what they look like or where they come from. And let me make one thing crystal clear. When One Nation talks about changing composition of our migration program, we know, we know what you mean. It's not simply a technical Order. or abstract debate about temporary versus permanent migration, or skilled workers versus family reunion. For One Nation, the party of the Muslim ban, 
and decades of overt racism. It is about something else entirely. Just two years ago, the former senator, Senator Anning, who was elected as a One Nation senator, said the quiet part aloud in his widely condemned first speech, calling for a migration program that reflects the historic European Christian composition of Australian society. That senator, thankfully, is gone, but unfortunately, One Nation is still here. If you had your way, I would have never been allowed in this country that I call home, let alone sit in this parliament and the Senate chamber. Shame on you. For all your talk about supporting good migrants who speak perfect English and assimilate completely, you would rather we just go back to the white Australia policy. Well, we are not going back to white Australia. And it's not just one nation sitting here relentlessly pursuing their agenda of racism and xenophobia, but it's also the Liberals sitting over there and the Labour Party sitting over there who must cop blame as well. The Liberals have for years targeted and fanned the flames of hatred from targeting the Sudanese community to Lebanese Muslim migrants to asylum seekers and refugees. And the Labour Party's hands are dirty as well with its continuous dog-whistling Australian first rhetoric. This posturing and rhetoric normalizes and gives oxygen to one nation's racism and xenophobia. It hurts and damages us. We are not here as fodder for your inherent biases and white supremacy that you want to exert. We are proud, upstanding citizens of this country, and we work hard to make Australia a better place. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Just let Senator Scar get to the lectern. Senator Scar, please. Well, Mr. Acting Deputy President, the first thing I'd like to note is that the wording of this resolution comes from an article which was written by Senator Keneally. Now, the contributions we've heard so far from both my friend Senator Ciccone and Senator Faruqi did not mention that, did not explicitly recognise that the origin of this resolution comes from the wording of the article, Christine Keneally's article, Senator Keneally's article in, in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 3rd of May 2020. So just as Senator Wong had to go in on Q&A on a Monday night and put the pieces together after Senator Keneally's article, now poor old Senator Ciccone has to turn up in the chamber and put, put the pieces together for the Labor Party after Senator Keneally's article. But at least be honest with this chamber. At least be honest with this chamber that the specific wording in this resolution comes from Senator Keneally's article, from her article. Those are her words. I have read the article from front to start. They are her words. Now, I'd just like to uh, make three points. Uh, in the time I have available in this debate. The first point I'd like to make is, Senator Ciccone, it's good to hear that you're having an inquiry into uh, temporary migration. It would have been a good thing, through the uh, Acting Deputy President, if Senator Keneally, as the spokesperson for the opposition, might have waited for the inquiry to take, uh, to take full effect and actually come up with some findings before she wrote her article. But can I put to you that when you're considering your uh, your inquiry. You might look at a CEDA, um, C -E -D -A, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia report on the effects of temporary migration, which was released in July of last year, 2019, after the much quoted Productivity Commission report, and it had two key findings. First, contrary to some concerns, recent waves of migrants have not had an adverse impact on the wages or jobs of, of Australian-born workers. That was the first finding. Second finding was temporary skilled migration has been an overwhelming net positive for the Australian economy, enabling skill shortages to be filled and contributing to the transfer of new knowledge to Australians. Neither of those points were referred to in Senator Keneally's article, but I do commend through uh, you, Acting Deputy President, to the work of Senator Ciccone's committee that they might have a look at that research report. You'll find it very enlightening. Second point I'd like to make, and this point was made by Senator Chandler, the importance of temporary migration in relation to Queensland agriculture's industry. And during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
I received a, a copy of a letter from the Australian Banana Growers Council, Inc., urgently seeking changes with respect to temporary visa arrangements. And what they said in this letter was this. The banana industry harvests and packs 52 weeks per year. There are 5,325 workers nationally. Approximately 40 per cent are locals and 60 per cent are either backpackers, e.g. on 417 or 462 visas, or from the seasonal worker program on 403 visas. And in response to that urgent request that these temporary visa holders have their stays extended so they could assist the Queensland agriculture industry, the government, the government acted, and the government acted in two ways, seasonal worker program and Pacific labour scheme workers, an important part of our Pacific step-up policy, could extend their stay for up to 12 months to work for approved employers. And secondly, working holiday makers who work in agricultural food processing were to be exempt from the six-month work limitation with the one employer and eligible for a further visa to keep working in these critical sectors if their current visa is due to expire in the next six months. And that just shows, even during the course of this pandemic, how important some of those seasonal temporary visa workers are to the economy of my state of Queensland. The last point I'd like to make is this afternoon I had a call with a great fellow who's the uh, councillor of Baloo Shire in South West Queensland. And his name's uh, uh, John Ferguson. And I gave him a call because I saw a quote uh, he gave about the importance of attracting immigrants to country, to country towns like Thargaminda. And I just want to leave, conclude my uh, uh, contribution to this debate with his words. This is uh, Shire Mayor John Ferguson of Thargaminda. He wants more people in his town. It is not looking at who you are or what colour you are. You are out there with us and you are part of us and we are going to welcome thank, you out there. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I'm proud to be part of a political party, the Labor Party, which recognises and values the contribution that migrants make to Australia. We are a party that has stood strongly for multiculturalism and stood strongly against racism. Australia is the most successful multicultural nation on the planet. Half of us were either born overseas ourselves or have a parent born overseas. And we can be so proud of the role that migration has played in our past and be sure of the important role it will play in our future. It is a vital building block of our society and the public agree. 85 per cent of Australians believe that multiculturalism has been good for Australia. So, like the vast majority of Australians, I am incredibly proud of our country and the strength that we have in our diversity. I have spent my working life representing some of Australia's lowest paid migrant workers in sectors like cleaning, hospitality and farms. I visited migrants in their workplaces. I visited them at their homes. I've stood with them when they've spoken out about the rampant exploitation that they've experienced in these industries. I've listened to them talk about their hopes and dreams for a better life in this country. Uh, and this is what I've heard. I've heard that the hopes and dreams of migrant workers today are the very same hopes and dreams of all Australians, be they First Nations Australians, fourth or fifth generation Australians, or Australians who've migrated from all over the world in the decades since World War II. Those hopes and dreams are a good, secure job to be able to settle down and have a family, a community, to be safe, secure and supported, and to make a contribution back to the society that welcomed you. Australia's shift from permanent to temporary migration without adequate protections for migrant workers and without adequate paths to permanence has put those basic fundamental hopes and dreams on hold for so many migrants to this country. Our temporary migration program invites people here not to build a life but just to contribute their labour. Our temporary migration program cannot be said to be delivering that most basic hope of generations of migrants to this country, a good, secure job. 
because in so many cases it is temporary migrants who are suffering the most in the absolute shame that is the widespread endemic wage theft in our country. It is international students in the cleaning industry who are so often forced onto sham contracts well below the Australian minimum wage. It is backpackers and students who are working on farms and in hospitality and facing extreme rip-offs. Wages on farms are as low as just a few dollars an hour. Sexual harassment, coercion and assault have all been reported widely. And in hospitality, I've seen wages as low as $12 an hour for migrant workers. Uh, and it is also workers on temporary skilled visas who were ripped off too in the most extraordinary and brutal ways. Earlier this year, I met three women who came here on skilled migration visas who were locked in a house in Canberra and forced to work in a massage parlour. Their families back home in the Philippines were threatened with violence if they spoke out, and eventually they had the courage to do just that. Our temporary migration program invites people here not to settle down and have a family, a community, but to just work harder and harder to get by, to put up with the often unlawful wages and working conditions, the lack of respect and, in so many cases, the outright exploitation. And our temporary migration program invites people here not to be safe and secure, but to be afraid. Too often, temporary migrants are afraid to speak out because they fear being fired. They fear being reported to immigration. They fear not being able to survive in this country, away from home, without the job that they have. And at the first sign of crisis, this government has said to hundreds of thousands of temporary migrants, it's time for you to just go home. We won't support you here. And what is extraordinary is that despite all of this, every single temporary migrant worker that I've ever met wants to make a contribution back to this country. They work hard, they pay their taxes, and they want to be respected for their contribution. To be clear, it is not the fault of the temporary migrant workers who come to this country that they are treated like this. It is our responsibility as the host nation to make sure that migrant workers are treated with the respect that they deserve. It is up to employers to stop the exploitation of temporary migrant workers. Indeed, it is up to all of us to make sure that employers are treating them fairly, with dignity and in line with the rules. And it's not just the temporary migrant workers who lose out from this exploitation, because an attack on these workers is an attack on the rights of every worker in this country. We are and we remain the most successful multicultural society in the world, and our success has been built on the invitation to build a life here, to be able to work and be respected, to lay down roots to have family and community and to be safe and secure. And right now, our temporary migration program fails too many migrants who just want what we all want here, a secure future. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, how curious that not one Labor senator who's spoken to this motion has acknowledged the elephant in the room that was revealed by Senator Scar in his contribution moments ago, that the terms of this motion put forward by One Nation are lifted directly from the Australian Labor Party's new migration policy revealed by Senator Keneally in a recent op-ed. Well, to Senator Keneally and to the Australian Labor Party, how proud you must be of your new migration policy that now has the backing of One Nation. Labor got the front page treatment with uh, Senator Keneally's op-ed in uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, and that op-ed told migrant workers exactly what you think of them. And now, bang, in comes One Nation to support you. Well, Labor blew the whistle, and now the dogs are barking. And no one should be surprised at that. This is exactly 
what the Labor Party wanted. It wanted a unity ticket with one nation to demonise migrant workers, and that is exactly what the Labor Party has got. The Labor Party's stance since the election has been nothing short of shameful, but we shouldn't be surprised because back in 2013 it was the Australian Labor Party in government that restarted offshore detention that resulted in thousands of innocent human beings, men, women and children, being indefinitely detained on Manus Island and Nauru. And we all know the death, the human suffering, the torture, the human misery that is still going on today because of that shameful decision made by the Australian Labor Party. And if that's not bad enough, Labor is now, more recently, attacking people seeking asylum in this country by describing them as airplane people. Well, I've got a lesson for the Australian Labor Party based on human history. It's very dangerous to try and outflank fascists and human right ab rights abusers from the right. But that is exactly what the Australian Labor Party is doing. You've decided to focus on demonising migrants instead of focusing on the real issues in this country, which are in fact the need to improve workers' rights and to curb the power of unscrupulous employers. Those are the issues that the Labor Party should, have been, should be focusing on. You can't hope to improve the lot of workers in Australia by kicking down on temporary visa holders. You cannot hope to protect migrant workers by deporting them or seeking to prevent others from arriving in this country. Labor is strengthening the cause of Minister Dutton and One Nation here and making life more difficult for migrants and temporary visa holders. The Labor Party needs to get with the program, start pushing to help all workers, no matter where they come from. And they could start by committing to strengthen the Fair Work Act so that workers have more bargaining power. Maybe for once in Labor's recent history, it could actually start opposing what the government is trying to do, rather than dog whistling and seeking to lie down with one nation on the issue of migration policy in this country. I hope the Labor Party is ashamed of itself today. Senator Davey. Thank you. Um, thank you. I rise. I'm standing before you. I'm the daughter of a migrant. I'm like 49 per cent of Australians who are either migrants themselves or children of a first generation Australian. So I cannot support this motion at all. I agree with Senator McKim. This motion fails to look at the real issues that we should be talking about. And one of those real issues is how do we actually incentivise people to take the jobs that many of these migrants are taking in regional Australia. And when I say that, I don't mean they're stealing our jobs because they're not. They are coming here and voluntarily taking positions that are vacant right across rural and regional Australia. And without these migrants, our regional economies would be devastated. People in old age homes in regional areas wouldn't have carers. The cooks, the one in what did Senator Hanson and Senator Keneally have said, one in five chefs that are migrants. Well, I bet those one in five are actually working in a restaurant in regional Australia. And without them, it would be a very different place out there. Because I'm very pleased to hear Senator Ciccone and Senator Walsh stand up and support migration. Because, like Senator McKim and like Senator Scar, I wasn't sure what Labor would say after reading Senator Keneally's opinion piece. And, and looking at where their concerns are, and Senator Keneally's concerns largely about temporary migration and temporary migrants, these are the very people who live and work in regional Australia taking positions 
that have been languishing, that have been vacant. Because don't forget, it's this government that brought in the labour test, labour market test, so that employers can't just go and seek cheap overseas labour. Employers must prove that they can't source labour here on shore before they can apply for a temporary skilled visa. And I'm glad that they can do that. Senator Keneally, in her opinion piece, didn't say anything about how you actually get Australians to take the jobs that she thinks we should now prioritise for only for Australians. And I haven't heard a solution to that from Senator Hanson either. I've heard nothing about the importance of temporary migration in regional Australia from the Labor Party or from One Nation. And I'm, I'm here, I just, I just want to paint the picture to help Senator Keneally and Senator Hanson understand and learn a bit more about regional Australia. Because there are many employers out there who have tried but can't. Regional Development Australia, Murray, used to run a, a temporary migration uh, ad advisory service, and they used to get about 250 applications a year from their area alone seeking skilled migrants. These people fill positions such as nurses, such as aged care workers, such as doctors. I live regionally and without skilled migration I wouldn't have been able to have seen a doctor in my own town for several years. I should also add the, the, the nationals in government have also introduced two new regional visas for skilled workers, which actually require them to come to regional Australia for three years before they can apply for permanent residence. And it works, because once you come to regional Australia, once you see how good regional Australia is, you are more inclined to stay there. And that's one thing that we are doing to incentivise new migrants to settle outside of our big and congested cities. Now, when we have migration, it's really important that it goes to the areas which need it most. This matter of public interest raised today does not understand and gets the issue of migration wrong. Migrants, particularly working holiday makers, are absolutely vital. We have heard issues where in the Northern Territory, if we don't have seasonal holiday my, uh, visa holders and working holiday makers, and these are people, they, they're not permanent migrants, admittedly, they are here visiting our nation, spending money in our nation, but also helping us get our food and our produce harvested and onto our supermarket shelves. We've found examples where working holiday makers who fill short-term shortages, particularly in these rural and regional areas, inject over three billion into our economy each year. They stay longer, they spend more and they travel further, and that is all good for our economy. We are working to get our working holiday program right. It's something we're committed to. And in the face of this COVID crisis, we have worked hard to extend visas for those who are already in the nation so that we can ensure that we keep uh, people able to do our harvest jobs, able to work in the agricultural sector, able to work and fill those vacancies so that we can keep our business going. Because bear in mind, at the moment, our migration is currently zero in the face of COVID. And it's having a devastating impact on our economy. And we look at, let's look at where our migration numbers go. 47% of our migration numbers in 
were international students. Does anyone seriously want to put 240,000 jobs at risk by slashing that $37 billion industry? We are already seeing, due to COVID, the devastating impact the loss of these international students is having on our regional universities. In fact, the Charles Sturt University has put a number on it. It could be as high as $80 million a year impact on that university's bottom line, and that has a flow-on impact on the capacity of our universities to undertake vital research programs. 22 per cent of our net overseas migration are visitors to, regional and to, to Australia, and this includes regional Australia. That's a $45 billion a year industry. And 12 per cent are skilled migrants, and these are people who come here to fill the vacancies, who have the skills we need, who work significantly in regional Australia. They fill critical skills gaps right across the Australian workforce. Now, the Liberals and the Nationals in government are taking a sens sensible approach to migration. We have capped migration at 160,000. It is a cap, not a target. But it's also a responsible and realistic figure. And we are, as I said before, we're focusing more and more on skilled migration. And we've introduced the new regional visas to ensure that we get people out of our cities into the bush, and we hope that they stay there. Since the new temporary skills shortage program commenced, which replaced the shambolic and often abused 457 visa program, we've actually seen salaries increase. We've seen a $15,000 higher average remuneration compared to what was being paid under the 457 program. And again, it was the Liberals and Nationals who've implemented the labour market test to ensure that they are actually filling a genuine skills shortage rather than uh, being the cheap labour that this motion is accusing Australian employers of undertaking. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. And, uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, we are a migrant nation. More than half our population growth since 2005 has come from migration. High levels of immigration, especially skilled migration, help sustain Australia's 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth. We wouldn't have the Snowy Hydro or even the Opera House without migration. Migrants have come here to contribute to our country and have made their homes and lives here. But there is a big difference between an economy and a nation built on a properly managed permanent migration scheme and one that is dependent on piecemeal temporary migration. Because if we're not careful, this powerful, unifying, uplifting national idea will soon be nostalgia rather than reality. Under this Liberal government, we are changing from a nation built by permanent migrants to an economy built on temporary migrants. This government has used temporary migration to undercut the value of, permanent, of the permanent scheme. Before Howard, Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison, in fact for nearly 70 years, our immigration department actually managed the selection, arrival and settlement of migrants and refugees in Australia. As James Button wrote in 2018, we had a model of managed migration. The department arranged English classes and access to health care and welfare. It helped people to find housing, schools and jobs, to learn how to become a good citizen. And what do we have now? Well, we have permanent migration capped at 160,000 a year as a so-called congestion busting measure. But at the same time, temporary migration is soaring to historically high levels. Under Peter Dutton and Scott Morrison, the government couldn't care less about how migrants cope when they arrive on our shores. 
It's either too expensive or it's too hard to figure it out. And instead of investing properly in permanent migration, which brought us economic and social success, the government has lazily lapsed into a dependency on temporary migration. Now, where has that landed us? Well, for one thing, we have created an economic underclass of people with no stake or say in our country's future. These are people who have faced appalling conditions, but who don't have the right to vote out the very government who created the conditions for their exploitation. Instead of a managed process, we have the government turning its back while workers are sent to dodgy labour hire companies and businesses. That's the beginning and end of the migration process and any chance migrants have at a viable, secure economic future in our country. These workers are forced to accept pay as low as $4 an hour, often physical or sexual assault, extortionate costs for food and accommodation, and curtailed movement through the withholding of their passports. And all this has come up in report after report, as Senator Ciccone highlighted before. And all this does is undermine the hard-won conditions and pay of every other worker in this country, as well as the work of the good employers, because the good employers, the ones who do the right thing by paying the right wages and ensuring the right conditions for their workers, are now at a competitive disadvantage. The ongoing wage theft inquiry has received several submissions that include stories of this system's true impact on the lives of these workers. These submissions reveal that its very insecurity of temporary migration and this government's reliance on it has created the conditions for rampant migrant worker exploitation. Nowhere is it more evident than in the way that temporary visa status is used as a tool by unscrupulous employers across a variety of sectors in the economy to abuse, coercion and, denigrate, and to denigrate migrant workers. They are only forced to accept exploitive, unsafe and illegal conditions and remuneration because employers exploit their insecure status. What is worse is that the government has known about this exploitation long before the current debate. In 2014, we had the independent review and integrity into the subclass 457 program, chaired by John Azaris, with a panel of eminently qualified experts. And what did they tell us? It told us that a lack of monitoring and sanctions for employers who exploit temporary migrant workers was leading to the whole system being undermined. I commend the Azaris report to all of you who have, who have an interest in this subject to read it. Then there was the report of the government's own migrant worker task force, chaired by Professor Alan Fells and Professor David Cousins, a report that correctly describes in horrific detail the state of abuse of migrant workers. But again, this government has made it clear that it is not a priority for them, because it's not being glacially slow to act on the report's very sensible recommendations. Workers should and will continue to come to Australia in search of an economic future, but this government is completely mismanaging that process at the expense of these workers and our economy. They're letting exploited labor companies that exploit labour decide who comes to this country. Instead of the economic security, paying conditions and workplace rights that have embodied an Australian dream that is so attractive to migrants, the government has created the conditions for abuse and exploitation. Temporary migration workers are in turn being used by this government to undercut the wages and conditions that make our country such a great place to work and live in the first place. Australian companies that are exploiting migrant workers, companies in this country, should not be making the decision on who comes to this country. It should be the government, this parliament and the people of this country. Senator Hanson. 
very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, One Nation submitted today a matter of public importance, and that wording was, when Australia restarts our immigration program, we do not want migrants to return to Australia in the same numbers and in the same composition as before the crisis. Well, I have to admit, they are not my words. They were Senator Keneally's words that she actually said in her statement. So it's quite interesting that um, I've always said there should be a debate on this, and uh, I'm pleased to see that we actually got the call on this debate. Now, forcing the debate on immigration and foreign workers is often a thankless task. No one knows this more than me. When you bring up facts like more than half the nation's population growth since 2005 has come from overseas migration, you get called a racist. When you explain that, instead of flooding Australia with migrants to drive economic growth, we should be increasing productivity or investing in skills and training, people call you xenophobic. When you make common sense statements like Australians should get a fair go and a first go at jobs, people call you a white supremacist. When you argue like Senator Keneally did the other day, through you, Chair, that once Australia starts its immigration program, migrants must not return to Australia in the same numbers and in the same composition as before the coronavirus crisis. People even might accuse you of stealing One Nation policy. This is why today I want to say thank you to Labor's Shadow Immigration Minister, Christine Keneally, because I know she will not be getting much support from her Labor colleagues. Reading through some of the recent comments made by Senator Keneally, I can only assume she has spent much of her time in quarantine reading through my speeches from 1996 and taking copious notes. And because so much of what she said could have been taken from comments and arguments I've made over the past 24 years, perhaps Senator Keneally might want to make an admission here today that she's a closet One Nation supporter. I know it took Mark Latham a couple of decades to come out of the One Nation closet, but look how great he's doing. He's a new man and loving it. So are the Australian people. Today I want to reassure the Senate that if Senator Keneally wants to cross the floor in support of her own comments and finds herself thrown out of the Labor Party for breaking ranks, I will always have a position in my office for talented immigration speechwriters such as herself. I know I don't often get a chance to congratulate my Labor Senate colleagues, but I always give credit where credit is due. And credit is due because my revealing herself, by revealing herself as a covert to One Nation position on immigration, Senator Keneally has proven what I have long said is true. So powerful are my arguments on immigration that even a staunch opponent of One Nation like Senator Keneally will eventually be dragged, kicking and screaming, to supporting cuts to immigration and cuts to foreign workers. And I know there are many in the Labor Party and even more among Labor's allies in the unions who will agree with my position on immigration and foreign workers behind closed doors, but refuse to speak the truth publicly out of fear of being called a racist or some other meaningless insult. Right now, due to the coronavirus, there are millions of Australians unemployed or underemployed. These are the people we need to look after, not foreign workers. This is the debate we need to have. We can't go back to our old immigration program. Australians have a right to a job and a way of life that is not tied to welfare handouts. For decades, the coalition Labor parties have used mass migration and foreign workers to artificially pump up economic growth. For decades, they have cynically used insults and slurs to try and shut down the, this debate. For decades, they have re refused to admit that this is creating problems with increased demand on our limited services, housing affordability, unemployment and underemployment, wage, st wage stagnation and congestion in our cities. Senator Keneally and I have now warned each and every one of you that if we continue down the same path of the mass immigration and foreign workers, our economy will come crashing down. I moved to notice a motion today on the floor of parliament, 
And I'll just read out some of the comments um, in this notice of motion. And it's relying on high levels of immigration to boost population to fuel economic growth is arguably a la lazy approach. Letting lots of migrants come to Australia to drive economic growth rather than increasing productivity or investing in skills and training is a lazy approach. Instead of letting lots of migrants come to Australia to drive economic growth, we should be increasing productivity or investing in skills and training. As of June 2019, there were 2.1 million temporary visa holders in Australia. Australia hosts the second largest migrant workforce in the OECD, second in total number only to the US. One in five chefs, one in four cooks, one in six hospitality workers and one in ten nursing support and personal care workers in Australia hold a temporary visa. Another one, when Australia restarts its immigration, its migration program, we must understand that migration is a key economic policy lever that can help or harm Australian workers during the economic recovery and beyond. And when Senator Davey talks about regional areas, it says here, we must also ensure that regional areas don't only get transient people, but community members who will settle down, buy houses, start businesses and send their kids to the local school. The whole fact is that the Labor said I was pulling a stunt. No, the, all those words were from Senator Keneally, her article. That was Labor's shadow minister for immigration, and yet they said I was pulling a political stunt. No, I wasn't pulling a political stunt. The fact is that I called Labor out for what they are, nothing but um, pulled a political stunt themselves. And Keneally was the one that actually um, made those comments, but Labor clearly does not stand by them because they did not support the notice of motion today. So who's really pulled the political stunt? They use it when it suits them. As I said, high immigration props up our economy has been used by both the major political parties. And I will have my comment about Senator Faruqi today and her comment saying that One Nation stands by white supremacy. At no point have we ever, and I'm sick of the lies, put across in this chamber with regards to One Nation, and I'm going to call it out for what it is. And I encourage people to go to One Nation's website, look at our immigration policy, which is non-discriminatory. So that is purely lies. And to talk about our immigration policy, we need the debate. Australians want the debate. And that concludes this matter of public importance. Uh